uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have uh, a quorum to start the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, indeed. Uh, so we are starting right now. I want to thank everybody uh, for being with us today. Uh, this is, of course, a very important meeting, uh, which uh, is going to uh, be preparatory for a good full discussion on NAS and fees on September, uh, in our September uh, meeting. Um, so welcome all. I especially want to welcome our uh, official observers and foremost, of course, of course, Robert Buchanan, our PIOB observer. This is Robert's uh, first ESBA meeting um, as an observer. So uh, welcome. Uh, but of course, Robert is familiar with our board's work as he has been representing New Zealand external reporting board at our ESBA National Standard Setters uh, meeting. So warm, warm welcome to you, Robert. Um, thank thank also... you very much, Stavros, and uh, greetings to everyone. Um, I'll look forward to the discussion. Indeed. As you know, uh, you have the right of the floor, and I'll be asking you if you have any comments at the end of each agenda item, as well as at the end of the meeting. So. Uh, please participate as you see fit. Um, I also want to welcome Junpei Kato from the Japanese FSA. Uh, and of course, Galen Hansen. Is Galen uh, with us? Yes, uh, yes, I'm on. Thank you. For hello, Galen, our, yeah. our uh, CAG chair. So um, uh, we have the full gallery of our official observers. I also want to welcome quite a number of public observers, uh, especially those who are for the first time uh, observing an ESPA board meeting via the ESPA YouTube channel. So we're becoming YouTube stars, I suppose, from now on. So we have to behave and do our best. Uh, please note that in addition to the audio recordings, uh, the virtual recordings will now be available on the YouTube uh, channel. The uh, meeting proceedings you're familiar with, of course, the Zoom uh, functions. However, a very quick reminder that all board participants uh, are asked to follow instructions as asked to have circulated them. If you're not speaking, please place your microphone on mute. If you wish to make a comment, please raise your hand in Zoom. Once you've spoken, please lower your hand and place yourself on mute again. And of course, board members and official observers are asked to have their um, videos on at all times. As I'm sure you have seen last week, the monitoring group published its final paper concerning the reforms to the global standard setting process for audit, assurance, and ethics. The title is Strengthening the International Audit and Ethics Standard Setting System. This is, of course, a paper that we've been awaiting for a long time. And we have put out a press release, I'm sure you've seen that, uh, saying that this is a very good development and that development lands us right into the phase of starting to work for transition uh, from where we are now towards uh, the new uh, system. And of course, uh, I will have more to say about that during our September meeting. Next week, our planning committee will meet to consider preliminary matters relating to transition and implementation planning with respect to the final monitoring group recommendations. I urge all of you haven't, if you haven't already seen them to take a look at them. We think that they're uh, positive. We think they're in a positive direction, but of course uh, we now know that there is a lot of work that has to be done to set this up in a way 
that will allow for a smooth transition vis-a-vis, -vis, especially two items that are very important to our work. One is the integrity of our work program. The other is the integrity uh, and comfort of our staff, because that is going to be also a matter uh, on which we will be planning transitions. So we will clearly have an opportunity to discuss the way forward during our September's uh, executive, uh, the board executive session. Uh, now, uh, let me uh, fill you in on a couple more things. Taking into a, a account um, planning committee's advice, I have invited our two new board members to join working groups. First of all, Laurie, Laurie Ensley. I've asked, to join, I've asked her to join the tax planning group and related services um, uh, working group. Effective immediately, Laurie has accepted and I want to thank you very much, Laurie, for being uh, available and willing to do work. I know you'll make a great contribution. I've also invited Rich Huskin to join the benchmark uh, working group, also effective immediately. Uh, Rich has also accepted, and I want to thank Rich for uh, that. And of course, I do know, given his extensive experience, that he can be very useful in this benchmarking exercise. Uh, I would also like to inform you that uh, this will be the last meeting for Denise Canavan as Lisbeth Hastemann's uh, TA. Denise will be taking on new responsibilities uh, within her firm. And as a result, she's going to um, leave uh, the ethics board. She's going to step down from EIOC and the benchmarking uh, working group. Uh, however, Denise has kindly agreed to remain uh, um, on the engagement team group audit and EQR objectivity task forces until the completion of these projects. So I really thank, I really want to thank Denise for all that she's done for the ethics board. She's been a very uh, solid presence in our work and for all that she's doing and what she will be doing uh, in the remaining tasks that she's holding on to. Thank you very much, Denise, and best wishes for your new roles in your firm. I'm also pleased to announce that uh, we have a new principal, Kam Leong, who will join our staff team in New York on August 3. We look forward to formally welcoming Cam at the September board meeting. This is very good news for us because as you know, we do need uh, staff quite desperately. Now our agenda today, I'm not going to talk much about it, but it is of course um, focused on the two major strategic projects we have. Uh, fees and uh, NAS, and we will in turn go to Ian McPhee and then Richard Fleck in discussion of each one of these. Lastly, on the agenda, I have also uh, placed uh, an item which refers to our benchmarking working group activities, and I will invite uh, Laura Friedrich to give us an update on that. Closing, I really want to thank all uh, task force members and all the staff for their hard work in preparation for the agenda materials today. Without spending any more time on this, I would now like to turn to you, Ian, for the fees presentation and discussion. Ian, to you. Thanks, uh, Stavros, and uh, it's good to catch up with everyone today to discuss agenda item one, which concerns the fees exposure draft, and also uh, also to let you know something of the responses we've received. Um, and just to remind uh, 
people that the task force comprises Caroline Lee, Lisbeth Husterman, Mike Ashley and myself. Um, and we were ably supported by Sylvia Sramko as the staff member. And Sylvia has just asked me also to mention that she's made some minor changes to the attachment to Agenda 1, dealing with the categorisation of respondents between national standard setters and member bodies. And uh, there are only minor adjustments, but uh, just for the record, uh, I flagged that we have got some minor changes there and we will update that uh, uh, with the September papers. But otherwise, there's no change to the papers. And I think it's Diana helping me with the slides this evening. Uh, so, uh, so that's good. We've got an hour, um, which is not long. And, and uh, so I'll need to maintain a reasonable pace as we step through the slides. And if, there, if at the end of the session, there are some important points you'd still like to make, um, please uh, don't hesitate to drop me an email or Sylvia an email. Um, um, because the intention is tonight just to help us get an early indication of the board's views on some three important issues that we've flagged in the slides so that we can then develop the board papers uh, um, for the September meeting with that uh, knowledge of the board's tentative position in some of the key areas. It will just help us shape the papers a little more clearly knowing we've got a, a pretty heavy agenda to get through in September and December if we are to stay on plan. So the next slide, thanks, Diana. So um, as I say, tonight is just to give you a high level overview of the responses received and to cover the key issues raised by respondents and uh, to seek your early input into uh, how we might address the main comments from the exposure draft, particularly in the, in the, in the very significant uh, and perhaps more contentious areas of the proposals. Um, uh, with the task force has met since uh, the last board meeting, we met on the 2nd of July, and we've also had a more recent phone call on the 16th of July, just to catch up and to discuss the, uh, the um, um, key comments received and uh, provide some observations as well. Um, so after we get the comments tonight, we'll uh, develop the proposals for the September meeting as I, as I indicated before. Um, next slide, thanks, Diana. So just to give you an overview of the respondents, um, you can see we've had a pretty good response and, and certainly um, uh, some very thoughtful uh, comments made, etc. And I'll go into that in a little more detail. But um, um, the largest category of responses was from IFAC member bodies. The next largest category was firms and the third category was regulatory bodies. Um, so good to see that. And you can see from the geographic spread, we did okay as well. Uh, uh, so um, I think it's a credit to all of those stakeholders that they found the time in these uh, difficult and challenging uh, times to, to provide us with the comments. And all of the letters, of course, are on the IESBA website, as you will be aware. Um, most of the comments, of course, deal with the proposals. I just wanted to mention in advance just one, which was a more generic comment from the SMP, the Small uh, Medium Practice uh, Committee of IFAC, uh, who just made the, the point gently that um, the board might consider the impact arising from the frequency of changes to the code uh, uh, which, and of course they drew attention to the uh, restructured code, which was effective in June 19, the uh, COVID-19 then, and, uh, and businesses being affected by COVID-19 and resources being a bit strained. So they basically said to us, just please keep in mind the, the, the impacts on users of the code, etc." And it was, a, because it was a general message, I thought it was worth saying up front, for board members to just bear in mind. And of course, uh, when we discuss effective date as we have for these standards, um, then um, we, uh, we've already had regard to a reasonable implementation uh, period before the effective date. So uh, I think we are aware of that, but uh, again, because of the SNP committee, I thought it was worth mentioning. Okay, just to some of the general comments, um, 
uh, um, certainly the next slide, sorry, Diana. Um, the uh, respondents were generally supportive of what we had in mind here. Um, questions about the timing of the project, um, um, where some would like to see the uh, more, uh, have a more understanding about the PIE project and, and just um, how that will be developed before really providing responses on NAS and fees. And as I say, it goes to that coordination issue, which the board has discussed from time to time, but it's just been reinforced uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, importance of considering the, the three together when we formulate the effective dates. And that's already a decision that the board has, has taken. So I think we've got that under control, but again, just a, a matter that has been mentioned. Um, and the other point that came through from time to time is the, the, uh, the code drifting away from being principles-based to a rules-based code. Uh, we do see that from time to time. It's quite interesting and clearly it's a, it's a fair point for people to make. And I, I found it interesting that in some cases, the, the, the people who had made that comment also wanted a bit more clarity and a bit more specificity in other areas of the proposals too. So it's always a fine judgment as, as we understand, but something that we need to obviously keep in mind. And, um, and then the other matter that came through was the, uh, some concerns about uh, additional demands on firms and, uh, and uh, um, the proposed requirements creating too much of administrative burden. So again, of course, we are mindful of that and do need to keep that in mind. Um, so as you'll have gathered, um, and sorry, the last one, the uh, last comment, IFER and IOSCO support the directions of the proposals in the ED, but observe that some jurisdictions have already gone beyond what we have in mind here. So um, as you've gathered, some commentators believe we haven't gone far enough, others believe we've gone too far. And again, it's, uh, it'll require the wisdom of the board to uh, work out the, uh, the best position to take in due course. Okay, Diana, we might go to the next slide. So the first area and the first area that uh, uh, where we have a question for the board is in the area of um, the, the, where in the, in the exposure draft, we, we make the, the statement that um, um, uh, a self-interest threat to independence is created when fees are negotiated with and paid by an ordered client. Um, and of course, related to that is the requirement for firms to determine whether um, threats to independence are at an acceptable level before a firm or network firm accepts an order or any other engagement and or if circumstances change. So we've got a new requirement in there. Certainly the majority of respondents agreed with the proposal, just in broad terms, about 32 agreed. Uh, 17 disagreed in round numbers, so, so um, a reasonable majority agreed. Um, but um, the fair point was made by some respondents that, uh, that they suggested the inherent risk is a result of the client relationship and not just an issue specifically related to fees. And, uh, and that's already addressed by compliance with professional uh, standards, including uh, included in the code. So, um, uh, and there's a few questions of, of more of detail about whether the, the determination is necessary each time. There's a new engagement and the short answer is yes. And, uh, and, and so on. Um, and also whether the uh, determination could rely on pre-existing quality management standards. But of course, if we change the code, the, the, the quality management standards would be expected to refer to the new ethical ethical standards, not the not the formal ones. So I think I think we can handle some of that in the detail. Um, and the third point that came through was some thought that um, the role of those charged with governance in appointing the auditor and negotiating fees uh, does provide checks and balances in relation to the auditor payer model. 
um, I think I think uh, for those uh, you know who, who sort of work closely with boards, I think we could say that's not necessarily a reliable check and balance. It certainly is in some cases, but perhaps not in others. Um, but uh, so the, we the the main matter that the task force did agree with was the, the first very first point that the proposal does go back to risks related to the client relationship which is broader than the fee related issue um, no question about that in fact when i went to the code just to have a look at what we say about the client relationship yeah as, as as members will understand i actually turned to page one and it wasn't just page one it was actually the very first paragraph where the code recognises that the uh, professional accountant's responsibility is not exclusively to satisfy the needs of an individual client, but has to take into account the public interest as well. So there's no doubt about the point that's being make, made about the relationship with the client. And uh, our focus has been on the fees because the scope of the project is around fees. And uh, I just wanted to uh, I think we uh, need to advance the fees project as it is, but it is open to the board to at least consider as part of its forward planning with a, a separate project on uh, on um, on the relationship could also be uh, it should, could also be considered. So we're not disagreeing with the comment made, but I guess just looking for the board's concurrence that we don't open up the client relationship issue as part of this project because it would certainly put a dent in the timeline that we're working towards. So uh, Stavros or Ken certainly looking to get the board's perspective, any comments they wish to make, but certainly get a bit of a show of hands if you like that we we keep on the, on the project scope that we started with but then the planning committee and others can consider the, the opportunity for doing a further project if that's considered appropriate on the, uh, the broader client relationship issue. Okay, Ian, uh, thank you. Uh, Ian is inviting us to uh, agree with the scope and the basic definition of the project as it stands now, instead of extending it to the whole client relationship. Am I right? Uh, am I saying this correctly, Ian? Yes, uh, Stavros, because I think it's more than just a tweak. I think it's, uh, it would require, a, you know, a serious step back and consideration of the client relationship, which we fully agree is more than the fee relationship. I think it's quite fundamental, yes. So Ian would like a show of hands uh, to confirm that the direction the task force is taking is the one preferred by the members of the board. So may I invite you to do that, please? Uh, show of hands, please, in Zoom. Show of hands. Thank you. Ken? Yeah, we have broad support. We have a, uh, I see we have a, uh, not including task force members. Uh, uh, Rich, uh, I'm not seeing your hand. Um, are you supportive or not? Other, Rich is Ken? Okay, Rich, Rich has raised his hand. Okay, so we have, uh, we have uh, pretty much uh, Okay. Unanimous support, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Ian? Thank, thanks, Back Ken. Thank, thanks, Devros. Um, so the next, next slide, thanks, Diana. So this one, um, uh, um, this one actually received a, a good level of support. Um, there was 37 broadly agreed and a further 10 agreed with reservations. Um, so a, a pretty high level of support for this. 
And I'm not asking, uh, the task force is not asking for any specific feedback on this particular matter. Um, and the re requirement that um, uh, the, is proposed that firms not allow the level of the audit fee to be influenced by the provision by the firm or a network firm of services other than audit to the audit client was accepted. Um, I, I just wanted to pass on again, it's just a comment from the SMP committee. They made the point that they were supportive of the requirement, but I think a really useful point, certainly from my perspective, um, they said it's important for clients to be convinced of this message as well. That is, the, the uh, other services, for instance, do not influence the, the level of the audit fee. And they just encouraged uh, the board to consider out, outreach, outreach to get the message across that audit is a valuable service and not a commodity. And uh, they also flagged that an appropriate transition period should be allowed in jurisdictions where pricing practice for audit may have been influenced in the past by the provision of other services. So again, um, a really interesting comment that we need to keep in mind. And, and as we develop our issues paper, perhaps uh, the task force, we haven't discussed this, but might just flag the opportunity for a little bit of outreach to, uh, as we've done in the past, to those charged with governance and others, so they understand the profession's expectations of professional accountants and, uh, and, and don't have a client that sort of seeks to get a lower audit fee because of other services, etc. So, uh, again, a useful comment. Um, then on the detail level, there were questions about how enforceable will this be how do you you know demonstrate that you weren't influenced or the level of the fee wasn't influenced by the provision of services etc and uh, and whether we could use a stronger word rather than influenced um, so the task force has agreed to have a look at this influence is a word that's used I think in the European Union and perhaps other places as well. So we perhaps have to be careful not to create too many different uh, terms in the same space, but um, uh, we can perhaps also look at application material to assist in this area. But um, uh, the good news was that uh, pretty strongly supported this one. And, uh, and so uh, Stavros, this is really just an update for the board on, on that particular mm -hmm. matter. Yeah. The, the, the next slide, if I can go to that, um, um, on the proportion of fees, um, and and again, uh, pretty strong support for for this. Um, the guidance on, on determination of a large proportion of fees for services other than audit to audit fees uh, charged by both the firm and network for firm to the audit client, and delivered to related entities of the audit client there was general support uh, for this one um, people liked the fact that it was uh, you know principles based and um, and uh, and uh, I think we can we can add some uh, application material to to what we have to deal with the various issues but um, uh, I again I think it was um, it uh, it's not it wasn't contentious in the way we presented it um, and um, uh, so uh, I think I think we we're on on pretty good ground on that one. So Stavros, I'll, again, I'll, I'll just unless there's any comments there, I just plan to move on in the interest of time to to, to get to the, the couple of more sensitive matters that need to be dealt with. So uh, starting with the next one on fee dependency, so I might just move there if everyone's comfortable. Uh, so fee dependency. Uh, of non-PIE audit clients was one of the more contentious areas that uh, is in the exposure draft. And um, just by way of background, um, um, what the task force endeavoured to do with this, this uh, in looking at this uh, area of fee dependency, um, was to try and take the existing framework that applies to uh, PIEs and 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 use that for non-PIEs, but to allow much more um, flexibility within the thresholds 
compared to for, for the non pies compared to the PIEs. So um, so that's what we've sought to do. As you as you'd be aware, the PIEs have a fifteen percent threshold. Um, we flagged in the exposure draft the thirty percent uh, threshold for non PIEs um, to be considered to be fee dependency. We explained that wasn't scientifically based. Uh, I understand that number is used in some a limited number of jurisdictions, but not many. And um, and and the intention was that um, um, after a period of five years that of fee dependency uh, at that level, uh, there would be no requirement for the firms to exit the audit, but there would be a requirement for a pre or post issuance review. Uh, to be put in place, which is very similar to the existing code for the PIE, uh, for PIEs. So again, it's a mirroring of the existing code model, if you like, that applies to PIEs, but adapting it for the non-PIEs. And, uh, and so that was the proposal. And um, I guess it's not surprising that um, the threshold, of course, uh, uh, raised a lot of interest and made a lot of remarks. Um, firstly, of course, um, the existing code is more principles-based for non-PIEs, and some suggested we should adopt just a principles-based approach again going forward for, for uh, non-PIEs. Um, excuse me, excuse me, um, which slide are you showing right now? Oh, sorry, sorry, eight. sorry, sorry. I need the next one. Sorry, um, Diana, yeah, my mistake. I was getting confused. Uh, my mistake. Sorry, okay. everyone. My, that was my mistake. Right. I didn't call for the slide. Um, so, sorry, on fee dependency. So, let me just recap slightly. Um, so, this is the proposal where fee dependency is assessed as 30% of the fees from one client going to the firm. And... Um, and uh, the existing code has a regime in place for PIEs, but um, but it doesn't require it doesn't comply, uh, apply to the non-PIE. And what the task force decided was that when it came to um, non-PIEs, we could mirror the PIE existing framework, but to modify the thresholds to give more latitude to the to the, the smaller uh, uh, non-PIE. Uh, audits of uh, non-PIEs. So that was the model. And uh, we've got a bit of uh, a pushback in terms of the, firstly, the uh, adoption of a rules-based approach that is inserting a 30% figure. And the second pushback is the quantum, which we would flagged in the exposure draft, was not scientifically based, but had been adopted in a, a limited number of jurisdictions. And um, and uh, uh, some respondents thought the 30% uh, was too generous. Uh, others thought it was, uh, it was uh, perhaps too tight. So um, again, uh, necessarily there's judgment required there as, an, as to an appropriate threshold. And some, some uh, respondents thought we were adding to the, uh, to the burden placed on audits of non-PIE entities. And so um, uh, that's that's the that's the, the concerns expressed. And as I say, in terms of our response, the idea was to create a consistent approach regarding the expectations in the case of non-PIEs that is similar to that that applies to PIEs. But at the end of the day, uh, the question is: um, Do we include a thirty percent threshold going forward? Uh, or do we just revert back to a principles-based approach? And just uh, the other point I need to make is that in the exposure draft, when we flagged the 30% and we said, you know, that it, it was a judgment without a whole lot of science behind it, we did say, we did say that the board uh, will consider reviewing the threshold, that is the 30% figure, um, uh, after a period of practice, uh, and uh, and I guess the concern the task force had in in putting the thirty percent in was that under the principles based approach, which would apply in lieu, 
uh, it may be a bit too easy for firms to, to rationalise whatever level of fee dependency they have and the 30% would at least be a hard um, uh, threshold for them to have to make an assessment. And as, as we probably need to be saying in the document uh, going forward, is that irrespective, um, the, um, the existing uh, uh, conceptual framework still applies to identify, evaluate and address threats to independence, even if the fees from a client are less than 30%. So the task force hasn't landed on a particular position. It is a change. It is a rules-based approach, no question. But the question is, is it in the public interest to, to at least put a threshold in there? And after five years uh, of, of the threshold being ex exceeded, there would be a requirement for a, a pre or post issuance review. Um, so I think we felt, at least at the task force, when we put this forward to the board and I think the board accepted it, five years is a pretty long time at 30% for fee dependency. Um, and, uh, and we're not suggesting there's any need for a firm to, to exit the audit even after five years. There's obviously communications as well with those charged with governance, et cetera. But... Um, but um, this is the uh, this is the um, the issue for the for the board to decide on whether we go principle based and apply the existing framework, and that's that's a, a credible way of doing it, or whether to uh, to deal with the excesses in excess of thirty percent. We can at least start with thirty percent and be willing to consider reviewing that after a period of implementation practice. So it's a tough one. There's no right answer. It's a matter of judgment, and uh, the task force would be aided considerably by any board any board perspectives on this. Thanks, Deborah. Well, uh, let me open the floor. See if people have views. Only one request from me. I do recall that we've had an extensive discussion on this before we uh, finalised the. Um, exposure draft uh, and uh, I think that the sense of the board at the time of the exposure draft was to at least have an indica a numerical indication of a 30% there uh, to, to give some sort of signal as to what would be, uh, would be the, the number for non-pies uh, and of course um, the task force also put in there that this would be subject to review after we gather some evidence. So please, uh, if you have comments at this point, do uh, present them, but uh, let's not repeat the whole discussion again, because the exposure draft did reflect, I think it did reflect the yeah. sense of the board at the time. So brief comments, please, anyone. Can, can you monitor this, uh, the hand raisings, please? The floor is open. I uh, have a comment from Kim, Kim Gibson. Kim? Yep. Um, thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ian. Just um, a quick question. I, I don't necessarily have a problem with 30%. I do appreciate the principle-based approach. And I believe in some of our discussions, there was conversation about how firms can actually try to manipulate that number so that it falls right below 30%. So I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, my question is, some um, member bodies and firms suggested to revert to principle-based. Can you give me an idea, not going back to all the comments, is that a handful? Is it the majority? I'm curious as to I know we put the, the board's um, opinion first or preference first out in the exposure draft, but I am curious as to the responders. Uh, thanks, Kim. Yeah, I've got some numbers here. So agreed, agreed with the proposal was 23, agreed with reservations was, ele was 11, and disagree was 19. 
So a slight majority on the agree, disagree, but if you take into account agree with reservations, um, agree, you'd probably say a slight, uh, slightly higher focus on agreement. And can I, just... can, I, can I say, can I tell you also, Kim, if I could, I've got the SMP comment here too, which goes to a lot of the SMP community, this issue. They said, they said again, another interesting comment. They observed that 30% is inconsistent with a principles-based approach, which is the first point they made. But they went on to say that uh, the committee considered 30% is appropriate on the basis it is in place in a number of jurisdictions and would be subject to review by the board. Uh, so they called us out on the, you know, the rule, but went on to say we, we, we accept it. And can I say the task force, or certainly I and Sylvia and Ken spoke to the SNP committee when the task force was putting this together, um, Kim, and they were, while they didn't give a view at that early stage of their perspective, they were understanding of where the task force was coming from and, and did appreciate that we were trying to provide more latitude to uh, auditors and non-PIE um, clients. So, and, uh, so I was kind of pleased that they said, A, you're not principle based. Well, okay, I understand that, but went on to give support to our position on the basis that we were saying we we're willing to review this uh, in time. Andy? Uh, sure, thank you. And respecting your uh, request, Avros, I won't repeat the reasons, but it probably comes as no surprise that I do uh, appreciate the comments about principles based, support them. Just also want to indicate that it's not just the 30% that's a bright line, that's a rule, it's also the five years. So uh, I think. I still think that a uh, principles-based approach with a strong reference to the conceptual framework is a stronger standard, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian Friedrich. Thanks, Ken. Um, and, I, and I guess I won't repeat myself either, but I am sympathetic to the, the comments being made around a principles-based approach. I, I just find that having that, that direct target of well, two things, I guess, 30% five years still seems, it, it just appears weak to me, just in terms of uh, the, both the threshold and the length of time that you can be permitted to be that dependent on a single client. Uh, and in terms of a principles-based approach, I guess I still really do appreciate the fact that if it's principles-based, I do need to use my own judgment to sort out whether there really is uh, fee dependence and then would be required to have justifications for that and so on, rather than just simply saying, well, I'm on side of this rule, so I think it's fine. And, uh, and I know we have more broad requirements, you know, in terms of the, the fundamental principles that could lead me in that direction in any event, but somehow I'm just not directed there. I don't know if application material might be, uh, might be useful in this case, but in any event, thanks. Uh, Kim, I see sure. your hand still up. Uh, did you have any co another comment or, or not? Okay, uh, I see no other comments, Ian. Uh, thanks, Ken. So I think we could just, it'd be, be handy to, if, 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 if we could just get a, an idea of the, where the balance of the board is on this one. So we, we either, adopt a principles based in the next draft or we we stay with the 30 percent and uh, and uh, we may need to at the moment the wording in the exposure draft is the, you know we will consider whether we undertake a review I think uh, again the task force and the board will need to decide but if we go with the 30 percent it's probably desirable to commit to a review after a period of time rather than just consider whether we have one or not but that's getting into the detail, Ken. But so the short answer is yes. Do we stay with the 30% model and, and, and refine it in the light of comments that we've received? Or do we go principles-based and, and bring forward a paper 
uh, with the um, uh, in September with a, a, a more principles based orientation in the requirements for non PIEs. Okay, so uh, Ian, you want the sense of the board over this choice? Uh, yes, now? That was, thank, thank okay. you. That would be good. And I would like uh, to invite members uh, to raise hands. First, those who prefer to stay where we are with the 30% in five years, uh, please raise your hand now. Show your hand. Can I, can, can I, can I ask the next question? Have you taken yeah, account? Most, yeah, most board members are supportive. Uh, Andy, yes. your hand is down, uh, understandably, given your earlier comments. Brian, uh, I, I've not seen your hands hand raised. Uh, do you have a different view on, on this question as to whether to stay with the approach in the exposure draft? Is yeah, no, I, I, I think my views would be that my preference would be for a principles based principles. approach. I can certainly live with the, uh, the, the, the option the way it stands, so in having a post implementation review. Okay. okay, 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 so you have the sense of the board, um, Ian. You have the sense of the board. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Stavros, thank you, Ken, and thank you, everyone. That's uh, that's helpful. So uh, then the next slide, thanks, Diana, if I could. So this one, uh, this is fee dependency of PIE audit clients and um, um, the, certainly the majority uh, supported the proposed provisions, um, which are captured above. Now, of course, the more contentious one was the, the, um, the second requirement there for a firm to cease to be the auditor if fee dependency continues after five consecutive years. Um, in terms of round numbers, just uh, given I've given the numbers on the earlier ones, 29 respondents agreed. Agree with re reservations was a further nine. Disagreed was 13. And no comment was 11 just uh, um, in total. Um, so a reasonable majority supported the provisions. But some raised, uh, as, the, as the slide says, some respondents raised having a definite period in a global code could have unintended consequences and create some implementation challenges. Um, uh, uh, that's true. And of course, as everyone understands, the code is respectful of law and regulations as well. So of course, that would, that would prevail. Um, and others were suggesting a, 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 a stronger role for those charged with governance in, in the decision making. Um, and uh, 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 so I guess that's, that's always desirable. Um, it is always desirable. And we've sought to in, in enhance the communication with those charged with governance. So we've endeavoured to um, respond on that. Um, and of course, we can't require those charged with governance through the code to, to take any particular decision, etc. So um, we've done, we've gone some way down the track on this one in terms of the comments, and we, we're pretty comfortable with where we've landed. Um, um, and, uh, and so, um, uh, Stavros and uh, Ken, we weren't looking to get a decision, any further commentary from the board unless someone's got a burning issue they want to make. We were going to just take on board the comments as appropriate, uh, but stick with the model we have in place. That's where mm. we, we landed. Well, let me see if somebody has a burning issue, as you say. Um, anybody? Would like to step in at this point? I see no raised hands, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, go on, please, Ian. Okay, so leaving the best to last, Stavros, um, uh, transparency uh, is the next one. And uh, 
And so this is a really this is a really interesting one. Um, most respondents certainly acknowledge the benefits of enhanced transparency about fee related information. Uh, and and so that was that was a positive. But they also recognise that um, a high level of fee to transparency exists in a range of jurisdictions already. And uh, and uh, and the third thing that they made commentary about is there's no significant issues with enhancing communications with those charged with governance uh, on fee-related issues. Uh, no problems with the audit firm doing that. So, you know, uh, uh, quite a good level of support. Where we where we started to get divergences uh, in the responses, I guess there was three broad categories of responses, if I can deal with it in this way. Firstly, um, uh, transparency of the, the one view is leave it for the regulators, the standard setters, or, or, or others who have got responsibility in this area. It's a governance matter uh, to get the you know, the fee, level of fees, etc and the disclosure thereof and it's not it's not within the remit of the code to to go down this path <clears throat> so that's one one perspective um, um, and and i should i should give you the broad numbers too just so it'll help perhaps you frame things the agreed with this our proposals on transparency was 18, agreed with reservations, 13, and disagreed, 24. So it's probably the highest level of disagreement in the issues that I'm raising here. And a lot of those felt it was outside the remit of the code. Uh, but when you add the agree and uh, uh, agree with reservations, you get a number that's higher, 31 or something. Um, so, so you've got a slightly higher number if you want to uh, argue the case is, is still uh, worth pursuing. So, as I say, for me, there were three broad categories. One was uh, leave it for others to deal with. Two was um, uh, uh, basically uh, support the proposals as they are, but that didn't have a uh, uh, clear, clear majority support. The third one was support the proposals. The third category or, or approach we could adopt is support the, the proposals with modifications. And on that, uh, Stavros, there were two main areas of pushback uh, in terms of the commentary that I interpreted, and I think the task force as well, but uh, let me say I did because I don't want to, I want to leave them a little wriggle room if they want to um, take a different view. Uh, but the areas of pushback were certainly, um, uh, the argument was that fees paid to firms outside of the firm and the network firm cannot impact on the auditor's independence. And it creates a significant burden to obtain this extra audit information, this audit information on the fees for components undertaken by firms other than the firm or the network firm. And it creates operational difficulties. I think it's fair to say the task force was moved by that level of argument. We were willing, are willing to have another look at that one. And I know this was a matter of debate at the board level for some time. So that was the first area of pushback. At the moment, as you, as you know, we were trying to get a group audit fee for completeness to inform stakeholders uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the stakeholders have pointed out, well, actually, if you're focused on the independence of the firm, is it just the information for the firm and the network that you really need? And so it's registered. And so that would be one area that would be needed to be looked at. And the second, in, the second matter that uh, four or five respondents commented on was the relevance of information about fee dependency uh, to the, to the general public and whether this, in fact, putting a requirement about fee dependency in the, uh, in the requirements uh, would cast out over the independence of the auditor. 
And again, it seems to be a reasonable, and sorry, the related point was, would that also add pressure on the audit firm in terms of doing their role, et cetera. And so again, quite a legitimate uh, series of comments, four or five, that need to be closely considered and, and looked at. Uh, um, and so I think if we are to go forward with this one, uh, rather than uh, look for some other party to deal with this transparency issue, I think the task force would be proposing to, to take on board at least those two matters, but plus the other comments and bring back to the board a revised proposal, which is a bit more modest perhaps in its uh, scope than, than is reflected in the, in the explosion draft. The, I guess the worry from, not the worry, but the issue from the other side is if we say it belongs to someone else, even though everyone's supporting transparency, it's going to uh, delay uh, implementation at least for some time, I would think. And, uh, and I'm not sure that's in the interest of the profession uh, or in the public interest, but um, that's the, that's the question for the board. So, so Stavros, um, um, uh, I think I've broadly handled the, the question, uh, 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 the, the issues that were raised. I'll summarise whether, similar to the remit, they asked the question whether it's appropriate to include anything in the audit report about fees. Um, and uh, they thought that's, that's really the audit report, the place for the audit opinion, not information about audit fees. Um, but as you know, we did discuss with the IAASB the opportunity uh, within the existing auditing standards whether this information could be included and the answer was a positive yes, there is scope within the, uh, the requirements of the standard to include such information uh, if, if, that was, if that was required. So, um, uh, but having said that, I think uh, the, the, the interest in the board's view and the two view, the really the, the polar views are: do we do we say it is yes a matter for regulators or others, and outside the remit of the code, or does the task force bring back to the board for further consideration in September a a, a, a proposal that's modified in the light of commentary received on the on the exposure draft? Okay, so. Um... So Ian, you want you want this bifurcation? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So let me let me put the question to the board. Let me have a sense of the board on whether uh, we should ask the task force to come back to the revision uh, in in uh, in the areas where Ian in the areas where Ian um, which Ian noted. Um, Okay, is that okay, Ian? Yeah, and there may be some other. There may be there'll be some other material where people have made suggestions, helpful suggestions in application material, etc. Stavros, but these are the these are the critical areas. But um, and we certainly need to deal with these, and there may be some other incidental or or, or other well, matters. Well, but we cannot take a vote like that. I mean, no, 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 no. It's, it's yeah binary. Uh, on a binary basis, otherwise we're going to open the discussion now. Yeah, but yeah. I would I would prefer that we take a vote now and we open the discussion, which will be more fully informed in 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 September. So the question is whether uh, the board agrees that the task force proceeds to uh, provide a modified uh, a modified proposal in the area of transparency based on the comments received. The floor is open. I have a raised hand from Laurie Ensley. Laurie, you're the first. Thought we were voting. I thought we were voting, sorry. Um, I, I yeah, thought, no, I, I thought go ahead, we Stavros. No, no, I thought we were voting. Okay, okay, uh, yep. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's see. This is an indicative vote, clearly. No hands. Just give it yeah. direct. So a show of hands. Oh, 
Okay, and uh, I uh, see I see all hands raised. Um, uh, Caroline, you're on the task force. I presume you're supportive. Uh, and Stavros as well. You your hands raised. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so the board is supportive of direction. Uh, terrific, Ken, and and thanks, Stavros. And and you're absolutely right. It is a direction. It's not you're not held uh, to this as any part of the decision on the, on the end result. It's just an indicator is to help the task force uh, develop its position. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, so just in just conscious of the time, but in terms of the ne next steps, next slide. Thanks, Diana, if I could. So just um, just to give you an idea of the next steps, um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, and Sylvia has put in a lot of work already to develop the issues paper for the next um, for the next uh, board meeting, and the task force is meeting shortly, uh, several times, two or three times, to to step through the through the more detailed issues paper where we can do justice to all of the comments received. Um, so uh, that's, we're shooting for September as per our board plan. Uh, we'll have a discussion with the CAG and, uh, and we'll look to uh, also touch base with some major stakeholders as well. And then we're still on plan uh, for uh, the second read and approval in, in December. So that's, uh, that's the grand plan and, and uh, we'll continue to work closely with uh, Richard Flex Task Force on MAS and, uh, and, uh, and uh, deal with the issues. Uh, but as I say, if there's any, any, any issues that we haven't got to during this evening, but it is important to you, please don't hesitate to sort of reach out and, and let us have that in advance as well. So uh, Stavros, that's, uh, oh, sorry, I think the next slide is the very last one we have. Yeah. So that's the, um, that's all I needed to say, but if there's any final comments anyone wants to make or, or you would like to make, but um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. I, um, in the interest of time, I would like to simply echo your comment that if members have more specific comments uh, at this point, please send them to the uh, task force to facilitate them uh, instead of discussing now. So um, having said that, I want to thank you very much, Ian and the task force and Sylvia for the good work on the presentation. Uh, Ken, is this time to go for a break? Well, I see a couple of comments, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. First, uh, from Galen Hansen, and secondly, from uh, Robert Buchanan. Uh, so, Galen, may I turn over to you if you have a, yes. a Thank you. Or yes. question? Thank you. Galen? Uh, Galen, you're on mute. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, Thank you, uh, Ken. Uh, one of my concerns is always, you know, the, the disagreements, where do they come from? Do they come from firms? Do they represent the public interest? Uh, how does IOSCO and FER uh, view, you know, the, the, the questions that have been raised? Uh, it, going back to, to the very first issue, the one, the inherent risk is related to the client relationship. We had a, a a vote on direction, but not any discussion. And I, I guess I get a little bit, maybe, maybe I'm just a little bit confused. Are we talking about substituting the client relationship in with that issue uh, for the issue of fees and the issue of fees goes away? I, I, I guess I'm a little bit confused about what that vote meant. And it, from the outset, I thought that the the impact of fees on independence was an issue that was being addressed by the task force. So maybe that could be clarified. Uh, in my mind, uh, fees is is the issue. Client relationship it, it's sort of a circular issue because you're talking about in, you're talking about independence, and of course we're we're concerned with that. But if you default that particular item into the QM standards, you're allowing firms to sort of address that on their own. The public doesn't have any particular view into how those decisions are made. So I, I guess I'm a little bit concerned about that. Those are my comments. Thank you. 
Well, uh, just, just to clarify, the vote was not to abandon the fees and go into the client relationship, Galen. Uh, the vote was to stay on the direction where we are. Yeah. Um, Ian, you want to add something? Uh, uh, just, to agree, just to agree we, and absolutely be clear, Galen, we're how, staying the course that we've adopted and, and, and while we accept that the fee relationship is part of the broader client relationship, uh, that would be, to look at the broader client relationship would be beyond the scope of, the, of this particular project. And we were just recognising, acknowledging the leg legitimacy of the point, that the fee relationship is part of the broader re client relationship, but it, uh, particularly based on the board's assessment and vote on this one this evening, we're just uh, continuing on the track we're, we're existing, we're currently on. That's helpful, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Galen, thank you, Ian. Let me ask Robert. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to uh, Ian um, for a, a, a great um, presentation. Um, it's um, um, most interesting and a very uh, um, a good synthesis of the uh, of the range of submissions that have come through. Very comfortable with the direction of travel um, on this. I think the process is great, uh, Chair, to have this uh, uh, preliminary discussion uh, at this point as a as a prelude to the. Uh, the, the more in-depth discussion and the preparation of the, the board paper for that more indirect that more in-depth discussion in September, so uh, so that's very good. Um, on the timing point, um, I think uh, it, it, it sounds as if um, that is under control. As as uh, Ian says, there's clearly some anxiety about the the pie definition uh, project, um, but uh, it's just going to be very important to ensure that the the three projects remain in tandem. Um, uh, I don't have anything further to add on the point that's just been raised by Galen. I think that's uh, that that's been clarified um, clearly. The the client relationship is already covered, and this is a project about fees, uh, which is important. Um, uh, also comfortable with where you've landed on the non-PI um, fee dependency issue. Um, I think the signalling uh, effect of the uh, threshold. Uh, is very important and it wouldn't it wouldn't be a good idea to be retreating from that and to be seen to be retreating from that so that's fine um, and clearly with the pies um, uh, the, the, the the position is um, is fairly well supported there so that's good and um, I, I'd certainly support some uh, strength and role of those charged with governance in the in the pie area if that can be looked at by the task force um, as, uh, as as Ian says, it's not ever going to be a determinative thing, but uh, but if one if we can encourage um, um, those charged with governance to take more of an involvement, that would be good. Um, and um, uh, look, in relation to the transparency issue, we've had a discussion with the IAASB in relation to transparency reporting uh, in the uh, quality management context, and the same issue came up about whether transparency reporting is a, is, is a regulatory issue that sits outside the standards um, uh, or not. Um, and there are clearly different views on that. Um, the public interest direction of travel, I think on this is in favor of more disclosure um, and some accountability. But I think that there's, there's a couple of good points that have been raised. Clearly the, 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 the board here tonight is, uh, or today is very, uh, it's tonight for me, um, yeah. is very, um, uh, happy to, 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 to continue with the broad direction of travel and I'm sure the POB will support that uh, and also be comfortable with those couple of uh, issues on network issues and the, um, uh, and the relevance question just being uh, looked at a bit further with the, the, the view to a modified proposal. So we'll see uh, how that uh, comes through. Um, so thanks very much um, uh, and I hope those comments are useful, Chair. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, uh, we have a couple you. of additional. Yeah, we have a couple of additional comments from board members, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Caroline and Kim Gibson. Okay, briefly, please. Caroline. Thanks, Thanks Savos. Um, so I I just wanted to respond to Galen's question about um, 
the responses and, and whether we had considered um, the, the different categories. And uh, what I think came across was it wasn't just the firms at the member bodies, but some of the national standard setters also, you know, um, shared, shared the same views in, in disagreeing. And uh, what was also interesting was those who agreed were agreeing because in their jurisdiction, they already had those disclosure requirements, for example. Um, so they, you know, so in, in that sense, it didn't really make any difference for them in their jurisdiction because there was a regulation that was already in existence. Um, so the voice that was coming through, which we heard loud and clear was uh, that it, it isn't necessarily in the, uh, within the remit of the IESPA board to be setting uh, regulatory requirements around around corporate governance, and and that was why um, we then took the position that we proposed. So I just wanted to uh, explain that we did look at you know the the uh, where the responses were coming from, and also what was driving some of the agree responses. Thank you. Thank you, and I have Kim. Thanks, I'll just make this quite quick. Um, just adding on to what Caroline said, especially when we talk about the disclosure piece where we have agreed with reservation, um, I think it's important to understand what the reservations may be. And especially if it, well, in, in my opinion, um, starts talking about the component auditor fee and the ability to really be able to capture that appropriately and if not, what does that disclosure ultimately look like in the audit report? So I, I think it is definitely an area to take a look at with respect to the um, component fees. Thank you, Kim. I don't see any other hand. Do you see one, Ken? No. I don't? no. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think it is a good time to take a break. That should be a 15 minute break and we will, um, so it's 1712 here where I am. So it should be 1727 when we come back or whatever your time is, um, 27 after the hour uh, to go to the NAS. Thank you. See you in 15 minutes. Okay. Why don't we start? Okay, thank you very much indeed. And welcome everyone uh, to uh, Non-Assurance Services. And um, our aim today is to, where's the boy? Sorry, hold on a second. There we are. Um, the main purpose today is to give you uh, the flavor of the responses we got to the exposure draft. Um, and I should obviously emphasize that the views that we're expressing at the moment are to a certain extent preliminary and will be subject to further refinement. We met uh, a month ago and we, what we did was we tried to identify the most significant issues that had been raised in the responses. And um, we are looking to secure from the board uh, clarity about the approach we should take to as many of those five items as possible. And I am start by just telling you, uh, for those who weren't necessarily around at the time, we uh, we put out the exposure draft in January. We initially had a, um, a May comment period, but we extended that. Um, and uh, we got uh, about 26 letters by the deadline. And ultimately we got 66 responses by uh, the beginning of June. Those responses uh, are split, as you'll see on the screen. Uh, the majority, as is usual, came from IFAC member bodies and public professional accountant organizations. Uh, the firms, we got a solid response from the major firms, and we had a pretty good response from regulators and oversight bodies, including uh, members of the monitoring group. Geographically, it wasn't too bad. Um, I would say that on the whole, it, it was fairly reasonable from a geographic point of view. 
be nice sometimes to get more from South America, obviously. Um, and uh, I should just add one other thing, and that is that uh, there's a bit of an exercise going on at the moment to check that we are correctly classifying not national standard setters, member bodies, and professional accountants organizations. So the split you see on the screen here may change as uh, we when we get to September. That's an exercise being done uh, with Ken and the TFIS task force to make sure we have consistent um, classification of the bodies, of the respondents. Um, the overall, there was clear support for the project. Um, there was uh, some disagreement on the focus on independence and appearance, which drove to a substantial degree the criticism or reject reservations about the removal of materiality as a factor to be taken into account when assessing the impact of the provision of a particular non-assurance service. Um, there was concern about timing. Um, I suspect you've covered that in fees, but I'll still cover it briefly. And that related to two issues, the impact of the pan pandemic and the uh, possibility that finalization of the PI project would result in changes which were relevant to assessing the NAS proposals. I'll come back to that in a minute. There was caution about uh, three issues. Uh, the first is a concern that the way in which we had expressed uh, the prohibition on non-assurance services for PIs um, might, that included a self-review threat, might give rise to, might catch audit-related services, and I will specifically come back to that later. Uh, there was concern from a number of people, uh, mainly from the SME and SMP community, uh, that there would be a trickle-down effect from the PI proposals which would impact non-PIs. Um, I, I'm going to slot in there, if I may, that there was also concern about the impact on small uh, pies, um, an issue which really goes ties in with the definition. And thirdly, we heard from some that the code is being changed too frequently, and please think about it before you keep making changes. Uh, two areas that were raised, particularly from the... Um, from the monitoring group stroke reg regulatory stroke oversight bodies was concern, and I, this is an IOSCO repeat, repeated concern, uh, concern that using a professional from the same firm is not and should not be a safeguard that is uh, accepted, uh, acceptable under the code, particularly if it's, the, if it's on its own. And secondly, there is concern that we exclude from the provisions uh, relating to non-assurance services um, parents of PIs if they are unlisted um, and to a much lesser extent concern at, the, at not including uh, sister entities. This is the over and, un, uh, over and across uh, concept. But those were, um, that, those were the general themes uh, in, in relation to those two headings. On, we asked a series of questions and we've grouped together the responses we got. In response to questions one and two were the, related to the prohibition on self-review threat for audits of pies and whether or not the guidance was adequately clear. Uh, I think it's fair to say there was substantial support from all constituencies for the prohibition. There were of course some exceptions at the split um, was 48.18, by my reckoning. Um, the, there were many suggestions made as to how we could enhance the application material. Um, many of them were targeting the same issues, but drafting it in different ways. But I think that it's fair to say that those were fundamentally drafting points rather than trying to uh, target uh, the conceptual uh, point, namely the prohibition on uh, pi, uh, national, uh, NAS that involve a, a self-review threat. Uh, question three related to uh, application, uh, the provision of advice and recommendations and the fact that uh, advice and recommendations have the potential to give rise to uh, self-review threat, particularly in relation to tax and tax advisory. Um, 
the, uh, there was concern about uh, the phrase, have a basis in law that's likely to prevail, which was thought to be too subjective. I think overall there was a preference for is more likely than not to prevail. And this was a specific question that we asked people. But the main the point I really took away from uh, the responses we got was concern that we had uh, unintentionally, I think in our case, uh, court audit related advice, the advice that's given by auditors at the, after they've completed the audit about the lessons they've learned in the course of um, the audit and what the entity, audited entity might uh, take away or do better. And we, uh, I, this is a specific point that I'm gonna come back to later, but this was a, a very valuable response, uh, information or perspective on from the respondents. Um, and quite definitely is something that we will need to address as I will come back to in a minute. The third question, fourth question related to the definition of listed entities and pies. You may recall we used the um, exposure draft as an opportunity to get some advanced views. Those have all been passed on to the uh, PI task force. Um, and there was, as I've already indicated, concern that, uh, that whether or not the NAS revisions and for that matter, the fee revisions should uh, await the outcome of the PI project, the PI definition project. The fifth and sixth questions related to uh, the removal of materiality. And it was asked in the context of all circumstances that materiality was removed, which included uh, not only the pies, which we all uh, recognized earlier, but also certain provisions, three particular provisions that involved non-pies. Uh, generally speaking, there was substantial support for all of these proposals. Uh, there were some who believed that the materiality qualifier, as it's called, should not be removed from the three uh, non-PI provisions, um, but that was a minority view, and uh, we will look at that and the merits of those arguments when we come to look at the specific provisions and the drafting of them. Uh, Communication with those charged with governance, as you might expect, there was almost unanimous support. There was a concern. The concerns that were expressed were almost entirely to do with um, uh, basically very minor uh, breaches and uh, the possibility that that might give rise to problems in the future with, with people being, people's uh, firms' independence being called into question. There was a recommendation that we should have a documentation requirement, and we will have to look at that in the wider context of how documentation is dealt with in the code. And then the, the issue that did definitely <coughs> arise in this regard and came almost exclusively from uh, oversight bodies and regulators was concerned that where there was a pie within a group that was headed by an unlisted entity, uh, that should be uh, the parent should be brought into the scope of the appro approval process. In other words, if the auditor of the PI subsidiary was providing a non-assurance service to the unlisted parent, that that should be considered by those charged with governance uh, at the PI level, as it could impact them, uh, that entity. And that's a point I will come back to again in a minute. Uh, other comments, uh, general support for the restructuring and relocation of management responsibility provisions and uh, for elevating uh, application material relating to multiple non-assurance services to the same client uh, to a requirement. Uh, there was some uh, recommendations for enhanced clarity in the subsections, that's 601 to 610, uh, most of which I found personally very helpful uh, and we'll be going through those with a tooth comb. Uh, so those, if I, I think Stavros, I'll pause there because I go, before I go on to the five issues that I particularly want to discuss with the board, but it, just to see whether anybody's got any questions about the uh, summary, that summary of the responses. I should probably just add that we are in the process of preparing, we already have a draft, uh, analysis, of all the question, all the responses by respondent and sub and question, and we have a, a summary 
done by paragraph number in the exposure draft, and those will be available for the September board meeting together with the task force's recommendations as to how each of those comments or issues is addressed. Stavros. Thank you, Richard. Um, any questions or brief comment, remark on the summary that Richard presented, please? Always open. I don't see any, Ken, but do you? Because I'm not seeing the whole no, list. No, I'm not seeing any raised hands. OK. Richard, back to you. Thank you very much. So what we've done is to pick out five main issues, which we think uh, we would welcome the board's guidance on. Uh, some of them we have clear recommendation for you, which we hope you will uh, see support. And some of them we want to flag up as issues and receive any input or thoughts people have. So we've lettered them issues A to E. The first one is issue A, and that relates to concerns about the timing of the project. If you've already covered this, because um, I wasn't able to join immediately because I was at the IWSB meeting, um, if you covered this under fees, please tell me and I'll uh, take it very quickly. But um, the essence of the point was that there was concern that the NAS project uh, should not be completed until there was clarity about the uh, outcome of the definition of PI project and the ability to further understand how that would affect uh, part of the newly des designated PIs and the third limb was the issue about uh, the exceptional circumstances arising from the pandemic, the burdens on firms and on audited entities, and therefore uh, whether or not uh, it was appropriate at this stage to be introducing quite a significant change to the code. Um, and as, as the slide notes, there were a number of entities that concern, were concerned at the frequency of changes to the code. Um, so at the current time, the plan is that the NAS and fees proposals or projects will be finalized in December with the PI project aiming to be completed in December 21. Um, I think the task force has taken the view that there are two obje uh, uh, possible options. One is to pause the project now and resume it when the PI project is finalized, which would mean in practice that we wouldn't complete because we inevitably then also have to have a re-exposure uh, to take account of the PI project to the extent that we thought that was relevant, um, or at least we'd have to give people an opportunity to comment. And so you'd be looking at effectively a two-year delay in finalizing uh, the NAS project. The alternative is to progress the NAS project, but to be clear that the effective dates should be the same for NAS fees and the PI revisions, and to be uh, sensitive to when that effective date should be, having regard to the wider issues like the pandemic that has been uh, raised. Uh, the task force's preference is definitely for option two. Um, the fact is that uh, we have had general support for the NAS proposals and direction of travel since 2018. Um, I think secondly, the PI project, the PI definition project is evolution, not revolution. And I think for a lot of places, a lot of countries, um, the direction of travel is already clearly understood. So uh, as, I, as I see it, and as the task force would recommend, we hope you will agree that we should continue to bring this project to ideally a conclusion, ideally in December, rather than pause it and that we should uh, therefore keep going, recognizing that the effective date may be something that has to be uh, looked at very carefully. So that's issue one, uh, or A, Stavros, for um, board advice. So uh, you want discussion on this, Richard, or you well, want I'm, a show, show of hands? Well, uh, I think let's start by giving people the opportunity to comment. And then ideally I'd like a, a direction of travel or a board view on what, what to do. All right. 
uh, brief comments, please. Okay. Lisbeth Hastamans. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm in agreement with the task force's approach. Uh, I'm, I would not be supportive of pausing um, the project now. However, where I'm not 100% clear on is the approval date. So would it, could it be an option to have a preliminary approval so that it depends on the outcome of the PIES task force that, that potentially we could reopen the project again before it's fully finalized? <clears throat> Any other comments, please? Richard Skin. Yeah, um, uh, I do think that, that we need to keep moving on this project given the complexity and the volume of issues and the, the efforts the task force has put in to address the comments and see where that leads to. But I would encourage some consideration of something along what maybe what Elizabeth said, that there be uh, some be, means by which uh, those parties and there was who have expressed the concern about the timing and how they might feel about certain aspects relative to the integration with the PI project get an opportunity to consider that perhaps as indicated asking some specific questions in the PI project of whether they have any comments as it relates to uh, the NAS and the fees projects, even though those may be uh, effectively ready to go. Thank you, Richard. Okay, I see no other comments. Sorry, Kim, was that no other comments? No other comments. Back to you, Richard. No other. Okay. Richard. Um, so, can I then ask? Uh, well, first, let me say to Elizabeth and Richard, uh, two points, I suppose. One is uh, we'll, ha we'll obviously think about the point you've raised. Um, I will need to talk to Ken and Stavros about the uh, practicalities, etc. But I would also mention that, um, that will, nothing will ever prevent the board from revising the proposals as we go forward. But to the extent I need it, Ken, i quite like a show of hands, if I may, as to um, the willing the decision to go forward as uh, and try and get to finality, uh, leaving aside implementation by dis the end of December. Okay, so show of hands, please. Guarding direction of travel. Okay, you have you have the board direction. And, and board support, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you, board, for that. Um, then let me go to the next one, which is that uh, there was a number of people who argued that we should retain, as a generality, um, the uh, materiality qualifier. They thought this was a departure from the principles-based approach to the code, and they thought that the auditor's uh, professional judgment uh, should be something that was um, retained. Uh, the code, uh, sorry, the task force position uh, was pretty clear on this, I think. Um, we believe that the code's provisions, um, the overarching provisions are principles based. And there are in that, in, in that section 120 in the conceptual framework, clear provisions that provide that in certain circumstances, it's inappropriate for people to um, carry on with an engagement and that is um, that's reflected in the NAS proposals. Uh, we had from our um, uh, from the uh, respondents I should have said 48 supported the approach we are taking 18 uh, were concerned at the removal of materiality they that spread right across the constituencies of respondents the categories of respondents um, so this was not uh, category specific. Um, the, the task force view is that we should um, go forward and retain the materiality, the materiality, sorry, the approach to materiality that we've included in the exposure draft. 
and that it, we shouldn't change that um, at all uh, because it's fundamental to the, all of NAS proposals that we should have clarity in relation to the self-review threat and in relation to uh, where non-assurance services are provided to a uh, pie. Um, and I suppose the other reason we would, we would say, take that position is because we have had across the board support from all constituencies um, and, we, and we believe that that reflects the uh, feedback we got both through the uh, round tables uh, and as I say, through the exposure draft. So the clear view for, for the board to take a view on is whether or not we should hold the current position of removing materiality as a factor to be assessed by firms when determining whether or not a self-review threat gives rise to a threat that's at an unacceptable level um, when providing a, a non-assurance service to a PI. Um, and therefore, uh, once the firm determines that a non-assurance service creates self-review threat, the prohibition would apply. Uh, in the case of uh, entities that are non-PIs, that is, it will be addressed separately, and I'll come back to that at the end. So again, uh, Stavros, I don't really think that I can add very much to it. It's really a black and white binary decision of the board. Um, as the graphic on the right says, it's your decision. Um, but the task force's view is that we should maintain the present approach and go forward on that basis. And it makes a great deal of difference to the work we do if we can have clarity on that issue. So any questions or points people want to raise? And then ideally a show of hands. I have a raised hand from Sanjeev. So, so Richard, uh, I have one question. Uh, you know, in our country, what happens is that we have a list of prohibited services under NAS, which are clearly prohibited. You cannot render those services. And we somewhere believe that if there is a list of such services, then this factor of materiality should be looked at in case you know you are providing some non-assurance services to an audit client. So in case one is already have an exhaustive list of NAS in the country, uh, we believe that probably this, this factor should be looked at and maybe reconsidered. That's my view. Thank you. Are there any others, Ken? No other, no other raised hands, Richard. Well, Sanjeev, in answer to that, your point, um, I think there are several answers. The first is that we have the challenge of trying to do this on a global basis. And from a very early stage, we took the view that trying to come forward with a list of services that were, were or were not permissible, and there are some who've advocated that we should have a white list as opposed to a, pro, a list of prohibited services, um, would be very, very difficult indeed to get agreement on, on a global basis, particularly when you then add the fact that each of those services would need to be de de defined so as to ensure that we caught what was intended to be caught. And you've only got to look at the, at the differences in position taken on either side of the Atlantic, let alone elsewhere in the world, and look at the differences in the definitions to realize that that would be extremely difficult to achieve. The second reason for going with the approach that we have is that it actually does, it is founded on a principles-based approach rather than a rules-based approach, which is the fundamental uh, construct of the code. And so, although in some senses, the approach you would advocate um, has merit in that it is um, it has clarity and certainty, whether we could, we, the conclusion we reached some time ago was that that was an unachievable uh, um, route to go down as well as being conceptually incompatible with the structure of the code. That's why we haven't gone down the route that you referred to. Um, so, sorry? Okay. 
Please go ahead. Nothing from my side. No, I didn't. So, so subject to that, um, Ken Stavros, can I get a view on those points on this on this approach? Go off hands, please. Uh, I see all board members have raised their hands. Sanjeev, you've not raised your hand. Are you supportive of the direction? Yep, okay. You have uh, the board's uh, direction and support. Thank you very much, much appreciated. So now we come to is issue C, which I find um, this is not one where we are asking you to give a definitive uh, position, express a definitive position but I want to lay out what the issue is. Um, consistent with the approach in the Exeter Code, we have uh, retained the approach that the prohibition applies to related entities of listed, related entities of listed entities. That includes parent undertakings and controlled undertakings for other entities. But some uh, respondents have asked what the position would be in relation to parent undertakings that are unlisted entities. In those circumstances, could a firm provide a non-assurance service to an unlisted parent entity of a PI without information being obtained, provided and concurrence obtained from those charged with governance of the PI? Um, the view, the concerns that have been expressed on this have all come from regulators, oversight bodies, and the monitoring group. Uh, they have been consistent, uh, uh, consistent in expressing concern that we have that the provisions would not apply to an unlisted parent of a PI. And this takes us into the whole approach taken by the code to related entities. Um, the current definition is set out on the slide, and I'm sure you've all had a chance to look at it. Um, so I won't uh, go through it. Um, and then we have in 420, 420, uh, the, the provision that defines an audit client that is a listed entity that is including all its related entities and so on. And when it is not a listed entity, you'll see this at the bottom, the audit client relates, it includes those related entities over which the client has direct or indirect control. So we've got three different, or two passages in the code um, and uh, an implication vis-a-vis -vis the audit client. Now, <coughs> we think that the code should be clear as to whether or not the self-review th threat prohibition applies to related entities that are unlisted. And that seems to us to require looking at the glossary definition, which was the slide two before of related entities and the implications to 400.20. And there's a question mark about whether that goes beyond the scope of this project. And therefore we end up with two questions. Which task force should be dealing with this? And how should the uh, questions that we have had put to us be about related entities be dealt with? Um, so that's the issue. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's a clear distinction between uh, the position of unlisted parents of pies and what I would describe as sister or um, entities, i.e. other subsidiaries or controlled entities of that unlisted parent. And the focus for the uh, commentators has been on the unlisted parent. Uh, so uh, I hope I've explained it sufficiently um, and I would welcome board comments and thoughts as we need to <coughs> decide how this issue is going to be addressed. Ken, do you want to add anything to what I've said uh, given the implications with uh, the other groups? Uh, 
uh, well, what I would say, Richard, is clearly this is a matter that also concerns the PI task force, the PI project, and also the engagement in group audits task force. In fact, the, uh, the latter task force uh, has had um, uh, uh, quite lengthy discussions about the applicability of the independence uh, requirements across, across uh, uh, groups and, and related entities of audit clients. And uh, in Lost you. To unlisted parents um, uh, uh, is, is a central part of the engagement in group audits project. So it, it is a question that, that is, my sense is um, uh, the PI project should deal with the, the issue of where to draw the line in terms of the related entity provision, paragraph 400.20 in the code, uh, which currently is. Is, is drawn at listed entities. And, and the question is whether, whether that line should be extended to public. As to the question as to, uh, as to the applicability of the independence requirements to uh, related entities, You're breaking up, Ken. Ken, I have lost you, uh, and many Richard's others have too. Ken? Uh, Richard. Okay. Um, can I just, uh, prep, before we go on with this, let me just ex mention one thing, if I may. And that is that I fully recognize that the PI project and the engagement team project will all have to think about this issue. I think the question that's the task force, certainly I am concerned about, is, is, is the NAS position different to other aspects of the independence framework? For example, would it, would it not be right, let me put it this way around, would it not be right for the PI to, have a, to be entitled to and have a view on the appropriateness of its auditors doing a non-assurance service project for the parent company, which impacts, for example, its financial reporting arrangements, financial reporting uh, systems and controls. And so it seems to me that even though there may well be every justification for um, the engagement team to uh, project to address this issue and for the PI project to, does seem to me there's an argument, and that's all I want to put it as, an argument that the appropriateness of providing a non-assurance service may be a discrete subset of the wider position. And I think it's important to emphasize that I see that as a subset, potentially as a subset, rather than defining the general proposition. Ken, are you back, up, back in communication? Yeah, yeah, Richard, and, and, and essentially that's what you just said was, was along the lines of what I, what I, was, uh, what I was explaining. Um, so uh, it, more than, uh, amongst the free task force and, and, and the task force chairs, Richard, but I'll, 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 I'll want to open the floor now just to get board reactions on, on this. Absolutely. Matter. Well, these would be first reactions, preliminary views, because it seems to me that this is an issue that involves some coordination between task forces and some more thinking. So any board members who have a preliminary reaction on that? Lisbeth? Yes, hi. Um, yeah, first of all, um, well, as you know, in the PI task force, we have been looking at this particular uh, paragraph R400.20, and, and I do believe it, is, uh, it, it can be further considered as part of this project that will also give us the opportunity to go um, for um, well, exposure, as this is still um, in progress, this, this project. So from that perspective, I think it's better to put it in uh, that task force for now. But then uh, thinking further, um, I, I actually don't really see uh, a big solution in extending the related entity definition to um, all pies, because um, it really depends on 
uh, or it, the focus should be on the self-review threat. So whether or not it will impact the audit um, that you're responsible for. So to give you an example, um, if I'm auditing a PI entity uh, and that one has a parent which I'm not auditing and someone within my firm or within my network firm is providing non-assurance services to that entity that do not have an impact on my audit, then we would just apply the not subject to audit exception, which we already have in the code. <clears throat> and I have a feeling that we have had this discussion before already. Um, so from that perspective, it's not going to make a difference. The only difference or the unintended consequence of extending uh, that definition is that you're going to bring in uh, the provisions around business relationships and, and other types of uh, uh, provisions in the area of employment and potentially financial interest. But it's not going to make a change with respect to the non-assurance service. And then uh, also, but you haven't really mentioned that yet, but also from the other way around. So if you audit the parent, which is not a PI, but underneath uh, in the chain you have a PI entity, does that mean that you really need to apply uh, the PI provisions to that parent, uh, parent audit uh, when you're not auditing that um, PI subsidiary? And I personally don't think so because I don't see the uh, public interest in that audit uh, given it's not a PI entity by itself. So I, I think we have to be very careful uh, when the task force is looking into this situation and. And again, I don't think the solution is really uh, in the fact that you want to uh, adopt or, or uh, revise the current related entity definition. It's not going to resolve that problem. Or you will need to give up the not subject to audit exception, but that then goes against the self-review threat uh, approach that we have taken. Thank you. Let me, let me take a couple more. I see Laura, Laurie, and Slee. Yeah, just very briefly. I mean, it's clear this one cuts across, but it doesn't fit naturally, I don't think, into any of the current projects. And I, I guess I just wonder when we think about dealing with it, whether any change in that application of the related entity rule is, you know, a side working group or a side project. It's a question, not a definitive proposal, but Okay, thank you. Caroline? Thank you, Stavros. Um, I, I dropped off for a while, so I wasn't, I, I wasn't sure if I missed anything. Uh, but what I wanted uh, to, to seek clarification from Richard was whether is the question that um, the, the should be the same set of rules for all pies rather than you know the the focus on the unlisted parent entity uh, because right now if if an entity is a pie but it's not a listed entity then the the definition uh, of the audit client is is more restrictive and I thought or I got the sense that that was where the objection was, the, the inequality uh, in, in the treatment of a pie. And especially when in the pie project, we're looking to expand uh, possibly the definition of a pie. So, so if that was the case, or that's where the, um, the, the, uh, the respondents are, are pointing towards, then maybe it fits under the, the PI project. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ken, do you see any other hand raised? No other raised hands, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Richard, be mindful of time, please. Uh, no, don't worry. Have... I will. Um, I think the... Thank you for those comments. I, I think this clearly is something that needs to be talked about with the other project uh, project leaders, for want of a better way of putting it, um, and reach a way forward. Um, 
I don't think the point is going to go away, which is fundamentally this issue of a parent of a pie, that, that, an unlisted parent of a pie. And um, as I say, they've raised this in the context of approval of non-assurance services being provided to the parent. And we'll have to work through that with the others and see where we go to. But I wanted just to alert you to this particular point. I've got two other points, which again, I'm, got, I'm not going to try and uh, get a view on, but I wanted to bring to your attention. Yeah, uh, uh, Richard, just before you just before you move on to the next point, just for the board's information, the planning committee is meeting next week and will consider this particular matter. So we will have uh, Mike Ashley and Sylvie Soulier, who are the chairs of the of the two projects, in addition to yourself. Yeah. Um, the next one is that uh, Iosco, if you are, have challenged, as I said earlier, the adequacy of a safeguard that involves using professionals who are not audit team members to perform or review uh, the work. Um, they raised this when the safeguards project was going through and um, it was clearly, I, they clearly laid it out that this would be something that they would continue to come back to. Their view is that uh, there may be uh, professionals who are more interested in the performance of the firm than they are in the public interest, the needs of investors, and therefore they are, this is not an appropriate safeguard. Um, this was all considered, as I said earlier, uh, in the context of finalizing the fees, ED, but also in the relation to the, the safeguards. Um, it's in the fees, ED, new application material it is proposed to remind firms of the significance of non-insurance fees, um, to deal with the self-review threats through independence, and there are uh, proposed provisions to strengthen those provisions, um, including using enhanced communication and transparency. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, we need to reflect on how we deal with this going forward and um, uh, reflect also the fact that we have introduced uh, in two instances, uh, the need to use an outside firm, uh, either to review or reperform the, the function uh, so that another firm takes responsibility. Uh, IOSCO have supported that, but then, uh, and I think probably uh, with some force, a number of commentators have said that they regard such safeguards as uh, unrealistic or impractical. Um, I think the only way of approaching this is to go back to first principles and think through how we're going to deal with it, uh, deal with the, the concerns expressed by I, OSCO and IFIAR. And the significance of this is that it's a recurring safeguard throughout 601 to 610. So if it's re removed, uh, it's a, it, a declared to be moving on. The last of the issues relates to the application of the code in circumstances where law, regulation or auditing standards um, address a particular position. And this comes, this is the point that I referred to earlier about in particular the provisions relating to advice and recommendations and the risk of a safeguard of a, of a uh, self review threat arising there, arising in relation to um, uh, the provision of advice and recommendations. And uh, I think carefully ana analyzed, the position is probably relatively straightforward, subject to one point, because 100.3, R100.3, as presently drafted and will be a R100.7 under Roland Mindset, clearly states that if law or regulation takes a stricter position than the code, the code, uh, the, the law and regulation take precedence. I don't think there's any scope for uncertainty in that regard. The second area that arises is where laws or regulations permit, but don't require provision of a non-assurance service. And pausing there, that is a position that is possible under the European regulation which allows national national, national bodies, national members to um, permit something that is currently uh, under the regulation uh, 
not permitted. So the possibility exists that laws or regulations will permit the provision of a non-assurance that would be prohibited under our provisions. And the again, the current code in 100.3A1 makes it clear that in those circumstances, the obligation of a professional accountant is to comply with the more stringent provisions unless it's prohibited by law or regulation. And I therefore think that as currently drafted, the code clearly provides that permissive provisions uh, do not take precedence over the code if the code is stricter. The third area, and this is the one which I think it raises a valid issue, is where uh, the provision of advice and recommendations might create a self-review threat and would therefore be prohibited, uh, but it's contemplated by auditing standards. Now that possibility that position is not addressed in the code because the code only deals with laws and regulations and doesn't deal with applicable standards. And uh, subject to any thoughts the board may have, uh, the current thinking is that we might include a paragraph to make it clear that the provision of advice and recommendations that is contemplated in auditing standards is not caught by the prohibition in R614. Um, and that, I think, is uh, that's the, our thoughts as to how we might deal with this particular issue. Um, so I would be grateful for any views people have on that particular point, um, and uh, then quickly finish off the presentation. Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, views but very brief views please because we're really running against time here uh laurie ensley laurie yeah very briefly i support that i think that's a good that's a good position to take on that um and it's certainly within the spirit of what what is expected by auditors going forward in terms of raising issues etc thank you laurie Brian Friedrich. I can, yeah, no, I also support the task force's view there. I, I, I agree, one and two are adequately covered in your approach to three, makes sense. Thanks. Anyone else? No, I see no other hands, uh, Mr. Chairman. Richard. Okay, okay. Thank you. So moving forward, uh, we will now take note of the input you've very helpfully given us today. We will work our way through drafting suggestions and other points that are raised in, by respondents. We have a whole series of meetings scheduled through the end of this month and through August. Um, I think it's fair to say that the main points that we will have to deal with relate to uh, the uh, application material on identification of a self-review threat. And there is also, or there are also a number of uh, suggested amendments uh, as to how we express the way in which we deal with advocacy threats, because uh, very often a self-review threat is accompanied by an advocacy threat as far as non-pies are concerned. Um, our timetable, as I said, is we've got calls through August. Um, and then in September, we will have a CAG discussion followed by a discussion with uh, the board in September, and we will have discussions with the forum of firms, IFI, OSCO, and the SMP committee. And like fees, uh, given your decision on timing, we will aim for a second read in December and approval of the final text. And uh, Chairman Stavros, that concludes the presentation. Um, and thank you all for your time. Thank you very much, Richard. This was uh, another very good presentation and very good information for the board. Opportunities not only to show views on direction, but also to think about various things. And let me echo what uh, Ken said, that the matter of related entities and where it falls is going to be, in fact, part of a discussion for the planning committee uh, uh, in a few days. So, uh, I... Are there any uh, 
Are there any additional comments at this point, please, from anyone, including our official observers? Uh, we have a comment from Robert Buchanan. Robert? Robert? Yes, thank you, Chair, um, and uh, thank you uh, again, Richard, for the uh, for the presentation. Um, uh, it's it's very good to see the level of support for the proposals. Uh, my understanding, being a relatively new PIOB member, is that uh, the PIOB was uh, pretty comfortable with the position reached in the exposure draft. Um, it, it is interesting to see from some of the comments uh, that uh, there are references to stronger provisions uh, existing in other jurisdictions, um, and uh, it's important to uh, uh, ensure that those uh, comments are fully reviewed um, uh, from, uh, uh, from an evidential base if possible. Um, because it, uh, the, the code obviously needs to uh, set a global position, as was said earlier on, um, but, uh, but there, it, there are also um, uh, important issues for national standard setters, uh, which may be challenged if, uh, in, in setting standards locally if the code is seen to be perhaps not as strong as it could be. Um, so just uh, urge consideration of that. Um, I think the point uh, that was raised uh, by the regulators in relation to um, the, um, the external review uh, is one that, uh, um, that is important uh, for the task force to continue looking at uh, as you work forward. Um, uh, and I certainly agree that it's useful and important to, for the sake of completeness and certainty to look at that related entity issue. Um, however that is done, that's obviously an internal issue um, for you as to how that is dealt with. Um, uh, and just uh, generally speaking, I think uh, question, the few questions have come up in relation to terminology um, uh, and um, uh, important to eliminate subjectivity as much as possible. Um, to uh, ensure that uh, that things are clear and uh, clear both for firms and for regulators as well. Um, so uh, urge some consideration to be given to that as well, so that the uh, so that the, the provisions can be as certain as possible. Um, and it's very encouraging to see the response on the materiality threshold because that's very clearly an important signal. Um, that um, uh, uh, um, that the uh, as Richard says, this it's a, it's a principles-based approach, um, and uh, uh, eliminating the the possibility of materiality is a really important plank of this reform. Um, so, look, we're recognising that this is a very difficult topic. Um, uh, it's it's great to see the progress on this. It's a challenging timetable. Uh, that you've got. And again, it's uh, very good to have had this preliminary discussion, I'm sure, uh, Chair, so that um, you'll be able to have a, a full discussion in September. And I'll look forward to coming back into that discussion. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Um, okay. Do I see Laura? Laurie? No, uh, Laurie, your hand is still raised. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think we can close this session. We're a little bit late on our timing, but we still have one item that uh, uh, we would like to do, and that is an update on the benchmarking working group. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Laura. Thank Laura. you, Severos. Uh, okay. Good day, everyone. I'm just going to leave video off over here to same bandwidth as I present, and just want to thank Diana in a, or Diana, sorry, in advance for controlling the slides for me. So, can we move to the next slide, then, please? Awesome, thank you. So in this quick session, I'm pleased to be able to update you on the benchmarking working groups activities to date. And I'll also be looking to get any feedback that you might have 
specifically on our proposed methodology, our approach for the benchmarking of the code against the U.S. requirements, as well as on our anticipated timeline. On the next slide, please. So as you've heard, the benchmarking project is a staff-led initiative, and the working group was established in April. On the working group with me are Richard Fleck, and uh, up until this month, Denise Canavan. And as Stavros mentioned at the start of our session today, uh, Denise is stepping off the working group as she's taking on some new responsibilities at her firm, and we'll be leaving her ISBTA role. So I just want to thank Denise for all of her efforts on the project to date, and wish her all the best in her new role. And as Stavros also mentioned, we're fortunate to have Rich Huskin joining the group going forward. So welcome and thanks to Rich as well. In terms of the staff handling this project, Sylvia is our project lead and we have Deanne acting in the oversight role. So we've got great staff resources on board as well. So with respect to activities to date, we're still very early days on this project, but we have had two virtual meetings so far to decide on our approach and methodology and we've done some additional high-level work that I'll come back to in just a minute. And next slide, thank you, that's perfect. But before I get into our approach, let me just speak a bit about the background and impetus for the project. So in the past, there's been some concerns that the IESBA code and its principles-based approach, as represented by the central nature of the conceptual framework, there's been concerns from some stakeholders that the code allows for too much flexibility and judgment on the part of auditors and audit firms. And some of these stakeholders have the impression that national laws and regulations that are more rules-based are also more robust and more enforceable. But these views don't capture the complete picture. They don't always give full credit to the rigor and strength of a principles-based approach and the way the conceptual framework and the specific provisions work together. It's also important to note that with the revised and restructured code, the independence framework has changed significantly since 2011, which is the last time that a major benchmarking study was undertaken. And of course, as we're all aware, it continues to be revised and enhanced through projects such as NAS and FEES. So one of the key aims of this benchmarking initiative is to highlight the strength of the conceptual framework and the independence standards overall, and to demonstrate to key stakeholders, such as regulators, national standard setters, audit oversight authorities, to demonstrate to them how the IESBA's independence framework has evolved over recent years. So in other words, the benchmarking is intended to provide both an operational comparison tool, as well as being a strategic exercise to promote the strength of the code in regulating the behavior of auditors, and to help overcome some of the misconceptions that might still remain in the marketplace. And if I can get the next slide. So building on this context then, the overall objective of the benchmarking is to provide a comprehensive comparison of the code's independence framework with equivalent provisions from other jurisdictions. And as a starting point, the benchmarking project will map the code's independence provisions for PIES against the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission rules, with the SEC chosen because its rules represent one of the most recognized independence frameworks. In the future, the intent, subject to resource availability of course, would be to expand the mapping to include other jurisdictions, such as the EU or Canada or others. And the next slide, please. In the benchmarking, we'll be laying out the similarities and differences between the independence frameworks by comparing provisions regarding the scope of the frameworks and their overarching principles, and also regarding what's allowed in terms of the relationship between an auditor and an audit client, and the activities that are prohibited or permissible. And specifically, the mapping will focus on the existing rules themselves and steer clear of how those rules might be interpreted or enforced in practice. Okay, and the next slide then. In the evaluation, we'll not be looking to state an opinion on which framework is more stringent. Um, instead, we're gonna be using more neutral language and looking at determining equivalence of the relevant pairings or groupings of provisions. And by equivalence, what we mean is that if two provisions are equivalent, then they apply to the same type of entity, they apply to the same circumstances or services, and that they achieve the same effect in terms of, for example, whether an activity is permitted or prohibited. So our work will highlight the similarities and differences in any of these elements. The next slide. Okay, so just a quick look at the scope of phase one. So in the first phase, as I mentioned, we're comparing the code to the U.S. framework. 
also in the code, that's the PI provisions in Part 4A, but also in the context of Parts 1 and 3 to capture that building blocks approach. And from the U.S. framework, our uh, scope is the SEC rules, but also the ethics and independence rules of Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB. And as with any benchmarking project, one of the challenges is that standards are not static. So importantly, we'll be capturing the changes to the code that come out of the NAS and FEES projects, and uh, also keeping an eye on the expected changes to the SEC rules as those come through. Okay, and moving on. So in terms of the methodology for the benchmarking then, it, it's important to note that similar to the codes breakout between the conceptual framework and then specific provisions, the U.S. framework has something similar. So although the U.S. framework is often referred to as being very rules-based, in the U.S. framework they also include strong overarching principles that are then supported with specific requirements. So with this in mind then, the working group proposes that the benchmarking be undertaken based on two different levels. So at that higher level, the focus will be on comparing the overarching approach that's taken by the ISBA code and its conceptual framework against the SEC's general standard, their overarching piece. Uh, and that'll pick up those overarching high level approaches between the two. And then at the more detailed level, the mapping will use a, a paragraph by paragraph approach following the structure of the code and capturing that part of the comparison in more of a database style model. And this provides a full systematic analysis. It'll be easier to update with current and future changes to the code. But of course, the comp comprehensive benchmarking database is likely going to be too extensive to be used directly by most stakeholders. So summary information resulting from the initiative will be presented in a format or potentially multiple formats that are most responsive to stakeholder needs. On the next slide, thanks. And I just want to spend a few minutes on the initial work that's been done so far, looking at that overarching or conceptual approach. So as I mentioned, the U.S. framework has a number of higher level principles, and they're found within the general standard of the SEC requirements. The general standard basically says that an auditor won't be seen as independent unless they can be objective and impartial. And then paragraph three, the uh, beginning of which is at the bottom there, lays out the situations that would be seen as inconsistent with being objective or impartial. So for example, things like having a financial interest in an audit client or an employment relationship with them and so on. That's what falls in there. And then on the next slide, please. So just to highlight a few of the similarities that we've noted between the code and the SEC rules at that overarching level. First up, both have similar approaches to the concept of requiring both independence in mind or fact and independence in appearance. So with respect to independence in fact or mind, we can see here that the code is broader in terms of explicitly referring to professional skepticism and integrity in addition to the reference to objectivity. And with respect to independence in appearance on the other side then, both the code and the SEC rules call on the perspective of a reasonable outsider, so to speak. But again, the code is broader here in that the reasonable and informed third party test references integrity, objectivity, and professional skepticism, as opposed to just objectivity and impartiality. And the SEC also sets the context of that reasonable person to be specifically a knowledgeable investor. So similar approaches being taken, but with different framing there. And then on the next slide, please. So as I mentioned a few slides back, um, paragraph C of Rule 201 reflects the application of the SEC general standard to particular circumstances. But as a starting point, the SEC considers whether a relationship or the provision of a service would result in any of the situations that are noted here, in which case the auditor would not be seen as independent. So if the situation creates a mutual interest or a conflict of interest, if it puts the accountant in the position of auditing their own work, if it results in the auditor acting as client management or as an employee, or if it puts the auditor in a position of being an advocate for the client. And on the next slide. So as I ran through those, you undoubtedly noted the similarities with the code's threats to compliance with the fundamental principles and with the prohibition on assuming management responsibility. And some of these linkages between the concepts are stronger versus weaker, 
So, for example, the idea of a mutual or conflicting interest in the top box there, it uh, clearly calls on the uh, self-interest threat. And that might also relate to intimidation or familiarity threats, but much less of a direct connection with those two. And the other three situations are very clearly tied to the code's concepts. Auditing his or her own work would be the self-review threat. Acting as management is assuming management responsibility. And of course, being an advocate is obviously the advocacy threat. So again, despite the traditional idea that the SEC requirements are rules-based, there is a conceptual or overarching level with a lot of congruence with the code. And that's something that will be spelled out in that higher level section of the benchmarking. And then again, under that will be the paragraph by paragraph comparison of the specific provisions. And on the next slide. Okay, so that's just a really quick update on where we're headed with the benchmarking project. And in terms of the timeline, we expect to have a quick demo or a fairly, hopefully a fairly extensive demo at that point and an overview of the key differences available in March 2021 with the draft benchmark being done in June 2021 to make sure that we have time to incorporate all of the final changes as they come through from uh, NAS and fees. And from there, then we'd be looking to embark on phase two as resources allow. Okay, and on the next slide. <clears throat> Thank you. So the working group is looking for any feedback in terms of the proposed basis and scope, methodology and so on. And also, given our goal of highlighting the similarities between the conceptual approaches taken in both frameworks, and educating stakeholders on the strength of the code's principles-based building block approach. So given that goal, we're also interested in any thoughts on specific areas of comparison that you think might be particularly informative or perhaps sensitive going forward. Looking for any thoughts that you might have on that as well. And uh, in consideration of the time, uh, we're also more than happy to receive comments and questions by email to, to Sylvia or myself. As I said, we're early days on this project, so we certainly have flexibility in that regard. And Stavros, with that, I will turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. And um, this was an excellent presentation. And thank you for being very uh, punctual on time. This is very good. We have uh, time for a few brief uh, comments or questions uh, to or, or recommendations, suggestions to Laura. So let me open the floor for that. I do see Kim Gibson. Only thing, Kim, briefly, please. Yeah, um, for sure. Thanks, Laura. I might have missed it in the beginning, but when we're looking at the SEC rules versus the code, um, are we looking primarily at the PI rules or, or all of the rules regarding the SEC of, um, comparing? And I, I just think it's really important to note in the document or the slide that you had where there's a lot of comparisons under the SEC rules, those on at least I think the left-hand side of your slide are prohibited, whereas our code uses obviously threats and safeguards. So to try, I think we need to be careful to say that they're comparable in many ways um, because it, it'll be interesting to note that those areas that look common are may very well be very different than um, the code versus the SEC rules. Thank you, Kim. Uh, let me see, Laura, if there are other comments, collect some other comments or questions. Anyone? Ken, uh, do you see another no, raise? Not seeing, not seeing any raised hands at this stage, Stavros. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if I can just respond then quickly, yeah, Kim, yes, absolutely, yes, it is uh, the PI provisions that we're focusing on. And uh, with respect to your point about the, the uh, prohibitions in SEC and the potentially the different approaches that are taken, yes, we are aware that that's something that we're going to need to make sure that we manage effectively to accurately um, show you know what the differences are, but also recognizing where there are similarities that come out at the end of the day based on how the decision would be made by following through the conceptual framework and so on. Uh, Laura, just a comment from from me. Uh, uh, 
the area of NAS, non-audit non services, non assurance services is, is particularly sensitive uh, in terms of the comparison. So uh, I'd encourage a working group to pay uh, close attention to those areas. Uh, and also to the extent there are exceptions under the SEC, SEC rules, uh, it'd be good for those to be flagged. Uh, I, I, uh, I know, for example, the SEC has certain exemptions for small, small firms. It'd be good to be able to flag those. So at least we, we have a, a clear understanding of, of um, you know, what, what's, what's excluded under those, under those rules. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for that, Ken. Yes, we're uh, obviously we're very aware of, of the sensitivities around the, the NAS. And again, that was part of the reason for setting the timeline, making sure that we could incorporate the changes as they come out of NAS and, and fees, obviously. Uh, and yes, with respect to the exceptions in the SEC rules, yeah, we'll be able to capture notes where there are exceptions or particularly notable uh, ideas or areas where we need to make sure that people are aware of those as they relate to very specific circumstances. So yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you, Laura. Um, I don't think I see, unless Ken does, uh, I don't think I see any other remarks from the yep. board. No. Okay. So thank you very much, Laura. We look forward to more discussion about that uh, in future. Good presentation. Uh, so we're coming to the end of our session. I would like to ask if uh, Robert or Galen uh, have a comment on this particular uh, topic. No, no comment from me. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Stavros. I think in particular that, that point that was just very recently raised about uh, comparing the NAS uh, would would be very helpful, and particularly the, the NAS that we're working on right now uh, going forward. And I, I do remember um, a number of years ago when I attended uh, one of the, uh, the meeting on the Green Paper and approaching one of the uh, uh, national standard setters who was in a uh, an important position in the EU, and I wanted to talk to him about uh, the threats and safeguards approach. and And uh, I I got a lot of, and he was very involved with uh, FER at the time, and I got a lot of pushback from him uh, about that. And I I think that uh, this this sort of uh, uh, project would be very very helpful in terms of uh, helping some of the uh, regulators around the world uh, come to grips with what this code is about and, and uh, uh, how we're trying to uh, w work with one another to make it go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Galen. Well, it has come time for me to thank all participants uh, to this meeting for their contributions, for good discussion, your thoughts. Uh, and. Um, of course, um, I want once again to thank EFAC for holding our virtual meet, for hosting our virtual meeting through its infrastructure this week. And very much my thanks go to staff for their hard work, which is always behind the scenes and which makes the meeting seem uh, very easy, seamless, but in fact, it takes a lot of work to put it all together. So thank you once again. Uh, let me only remind everyone that our next board meetings are going to be September, but now September is going to be extended since this is a virtual meeting. And our planning is for September 14, 18, 21, 29 of September and October 1. So the September meeting, which is going to be very important because we'll be revisiting the strategic projects, will be extended over a larger number of days. Well, uh, I don't know if Ken wants to add something on administration or technical issue. Uh, no, on, on the I need to thank our board members and our, uh, and our PIUB observer on the other side of the world. I know it's very late for Ian and, and Robert uh, in, in your part of the neck of the woods, as we say. 
Thank you very much. I really appreciate, you know, the, you know, it's, it's really difficult to manage the time zones. And, and I, I always feel for you that you have to take the brunt of it. It's, it's, it's very challenging. Thank you both. I wholeheartedly echo that. Thank you indeed. Well, thank you very much. And I've been uh, comforted to know that I've been not the only uh, New Zealand night owl uh, uh, tonight because there's uh, been others participating in the IAASB meeting as well. So uh, we'll all compare notes later. But uh, no, it's no problem for me. And uh, it's been great. Thank you very much indeed. So thank you all. Be well. Stay safe. Bye-bye. September. Goodbye. Goodbye.